Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Presbyterian Church of Willingboro. This is an exciting day. I know for all of us to be back here in the sanctuary. We are also uh, on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So we are continuing our ministry to those who are not able to be here, to those who are not yet comfortable to be here. But some of us are gathered here and it's wonderful. It is especially wonderful for me because I haven't met a lot of you. <laughs> So I'm going to ask for those who are here in the sanctuary, I'm going to ask for grace today. If I don't recognize you by your eyeglasses, I apologize for that. But um, please introduce yourselves and uh, we will get to know one another. I am confident that one day soon our masks will be a thing of the past and that we will be able to be together again as we have been in the past. As we do this on our first Sunday here together, I'm just going to share a few of what I'm going to call our ground rules so that we can continue this and all continue it safely. We know that as the Delta variant of COVID-19 begins to take root in our area, that we are going to have to be especially careful. So you will notice that as many of the windows as will stay up are open, that we have exhaust fans in six of our windows pulling the air out so that we will have plenty of circulation. We have the fan only on on our air conditioning so that we are moving air that way as well. And we have the doors to the sanctuary and the door to outside open. So if we are not sitting in a wind tunnel, it is not for lack of trying. We are going to ask that you stay seated 
during the entire service at the places where we Presbyterians would normally stand, we will ask you to remain in your seats. It is entirely true that you can project less air when you're seated than when you're standing. And so we're going to ask you to remain seated so that we can all be safe. There will be no singing. You may hum along. You may hum a few bars, but we cannot sing. Our choir is going to sing, and that is why we have moved all of you back that way and closed off these front pews so that our choir can sing safely. They're going to be spread out so that they can't touch anybody in the choir, and they will sing wearing their masks. We all apologize in advance if that makes the sound production a little cloudy. And it's the breaks of the game. No singing, only humming. Next week, if you'd like to bring a tambourine or something else that you can tap along with, make some noise, that is absolutely fine. Just as long as we don't sing. After church, I'm going to ask that you take whatever fellowship that you would like to experience with one another out onto the grass. Please do not stay here in the sanctuary and have your conversations. I get it. It's going to be painful for me not to greet you at the back door on the way out. Please consider yourselves hugged at this moment in time. But we're not going to do that yet. I will meet you out on the grass so that we can have a conversation outside where it is even safer than it is in here. We do have hand sanitizer all around. I encourage you to use it liberally. Anything else anybody can think of? Yes, ma'am. Oh, right. We do have the puke bags. And Renee's holding one of those up in the back. So you can all turn around and see. You might find one in your pew if you would sign in. And I am at this moment in time going to take your picture because you're all going to be famous. This is in case we need a contact trace. Okay? So we have a picture of everyone who's here. We know who is with us this morning, and we will be able to get a hold of you in case somebody gets sick. So everybody smile. Oh, that's right. You've got a mouse coming. <laughs> All right. We're going to do that every week for a while, and I think that will help us to be able to identify who's been in worship. Uh, if you can't find a place to sit, there are, already, there are more pews open. You may have to take the side aisles to find a place to sit. As you can see, we have really socially distanced ourselves. And um, this is in hope that we will all be safe, okay? Please, if you start to feel poorly, if you know you've been exposed to COVID-19 and you were here during the week, please let me know. Just let me know. We don't have to, I will not share so-and-so about us all sick. I won't, I'm not going to do that. But I want to be able to make sure that those who are sitting around you here in the sanctuary are notified that they may have been exposed and can get themselves tested. We all good with that? Everybody understand where we are? Okay, let's worship God. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but be room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Please join me now in the call to worship. The heavens are telling the glory of God. There is no speech, no words. Their voice is not heard. Let us worship God. Let us worship God now with our first hymn, 473. Cody and I will be leading you in that to grant us grace as neither of us is a professional musician. And normally, we'll, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Cody says, speak for All right, Cody, take it away. Oh, I didn't mean it like that. Thank I'm not singing.
Let us confess our sins, for the Holy One delights in blessing those who seek to walk with God. Let us pray together. Almighty God, everlasting Mother, faithful Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, in what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with all our hearts and souls and minds and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive us all our transgressions and grant that we might serve you in newness of life. Let us now confess our sin in the silence of our hearts. Sisters and brothers, rejoice and be glad, for God's mercy is great. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. together the prayer for illumination. The psalmist writes, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. Enlighten our eyes now, and rejoice our hearts, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our first picture is the same Old Testament book of Esther. Many of you have read this book. These are not unfamiliar words to you, I am sure. But listen now to the word of the Lord. Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. And then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a message for Mordecai, saying, All of the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. All alike are to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone who may that person live. I myself have not been called to come into the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at a time like this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Our New Testament reading is from the epistles, from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, beginning in chapter 12 at verse 9.
Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends upon you, leave peace, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will keep burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Twenty years ago yesterday, my husband Jim and I woke up in International Falls, Minnesota, about 300 yards short of the Canadian border. While we dressed for our annual pilgrimage north, Jim switched on the Today Show, where Katie Couric was talking about a reported small plane crash at the World Trade Center. Sad, we thought, but not a big deal. But it was. Something unimaginable was happening in New York City, and no one was yet quite sure what. We approached the border. A very young border guard met us at the gate, wearing body armor and carrying a machine gun. He didn't seem to know what he was supposed to do with. He waved us through silently. The Canadian-American border closed behind us. We were the last ones through for nearly a week. Most of us of a certain age remember what they were doing, right? 20 years ago. 9-11 was one of those days. We who follow Christ are called to remembrance to remember. Our remembering, our Christian remembering, honors the sacrifice of those who died. Our remembering honors those who have given so much since that day to protect our friends. Our remembering honors the grief and the pain of the families who over these years have lost so much. Christ calls his friends to remember, which is not the same as the cultural demand to never forget. Never forgetting holds in itself an unspoken imperative to never let go of what we felt that day. The anger, the fear, the hatred, to never let ourselves move past the hurt and the betrayal. To never, ever forgive. Remembering is a positive action. It enters into the other's pain. Never forgetting holds on tight to that pain and uses it against the other like a shield. As Christians, odd as it sounds, we work hard to forget and forgive, even while we remember. 
Our faith sings of the power of remembrance. In our Old Testament reading this morning, Mordecai begs his kinswoman, Esther, to remember. There he stands in the courtyard of the palace, dressed in sackcloth and ashes, a living, breathing, shouting, lamenting reminder to Esther of who she is and what she alone can do. Remember who you are, he shouts to Esther. Remember from where you have come. Remember all of those who don't live in a palace, in places of power. Remember all of those who don't have a voice to speak truth, God's truth to that power. Remember, Esther, that you're one of us. In the face of terrible persecution, the threat of total annihilation, remember for just such a time as this. Paul too proclaims the power of remembrance. He spends 11, 11 of his 16 chapters in this extraordinary letter to the, left, to the church at Rome. He spends 11 of those chapters reminding his Christian sisters and brothers who they are in order to push them to do what they alone can do. Remember who I once was, he writes. I was the worst sinner of all. Leave it to Paul to claim, you know, the worst. I was the worst sinner of all. I was persecutor of the Lord and his followers. Remember who you once were, too. Sinners. Everyone. Remember what the Lord did for us anyway. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Remember that you have been justified by the faith of Jesus Christ, a free gift that you have done nothing to deserve. Remember that there is now no condemnation for you, that in the power of the Holy Spirit, you have been set free. Remember that nothing, not your sin or anyone else's, not any power on earth or in heaven can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus your Lord. Remember that despite who you are and where you've been and what you've done. Now hear that again. Despite where you are, who you are, where you've been and what you've done, God has shown mercy to you over and over again. Remember who God has made you to be in the face of great persecution by the Roman power machine under the shadow of great evil and the threat of total annihilation, remember for just such a time as this. Theologian Will Willimon writes that back in high school every Friday and Saturday night as I was leaving home to go on a date, I remember my mother bidding me farewell with these weighty words. Remember who you are. My mother would say, remember Jesus is in the back seat. <laughs> kind of a buzzkill, you know? <laughs> remember who you are. You know what she meant, right? She didn't mean that I was in danger of forgetting my name and my street address. She meant that alone on a date, in the midst of some party, in the presence of some strangers, I might forget who I was. I might lose sight of the values with which I was raised. I might answer to some alien name. I might engage in some unaccustomed behavior. I might forget who I was. And so she told me, remember who you are. It was her maternal benediction as I left home. We too, are called to remember who we are for just such a time as this. Because you see, there's something about the act of remembering who we are and to whom we belong that gives us strength, it gives us the strength to live in to this identity that we claim as Jesus followers. When we remember, we once again enter humbly into God's version of the story. Our remembering brings great tragedy down to a human scale. It gives us something to do. 
It calls us into relationship with our neighbors and strangers too. Remember, it aligns us with the grief stricken. It places us shoulder to shoulder with the widow and the orphan, the poor and the helpless, the lost, the least, and the last. We remember hunger and we share our food. We remember thirst and we pour another cup of water. We remember loneliness and we welcome the stranger. We remember grief and we hold on tight to the ones who mourn. We remember if we are lucky. We remember the sweet, sweet taste of forgiveness. And we pray to find in that memory the grace to forgive those who name themselves our enemies, even those who wounded us to our core. At its best, our remembering tears down the walls that divide us, the walls that spring up when we never forget. This kind of remembering that we are called to, it's resurrection work, my friends. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. The promise of our Christian faith is that even the dead will be raised. Twenty years ago, Jim and I rode out the days after September 11th, alone on an island in a remote part of Canada, cut off from what was going on here at home. These were the days before cell phones, right? We got what news that we could from the TV at the local bar and grill. They were kind enough to turn it to American news. It was so quiet. That's what we remember for us. It was so quiet. The sky was empty. And we felt so very, very alone in our sorrow and our fear. One day we headed into town to try again to connect with our kids who were here in the United States. And as our boat came around the point into the marina, there on the flat boat, hung the star and stripes where the maple leaf had always been flown before. The tough old proudly Canadian couple who ran the place had somehow managed to scrounge up an American flag and they hung it where we would be sure to see it first thing. They wanted us to know that we were among friends. They remembered us and our grief. It is not too much to say that they changed our world. I don't think that very many of us would contend that we are in a better place since that Tuesday 20 years ago. But the witness of Esther and Mordecai and Paul and the claim of our faith is that you and I have been given what it takes to make the world a better place. One prayer, one holy hug, one cup of water at a time. We can, if we will, participate in what God has been doing since the beginning, what God was doing in Jesus Christ, what God continues to do in and through the Holy Spirit. Remember, my friends, we are the body of Christ in the world. And as our Lord and Savior healed and fed and forgave and raised the dead, so we too are called and gifted and sent into the world to do likewise. Remember, remember that on this weekend of remembrance. Remember who you are and speak God's reconciling, merciful, truth to power. Remember what God has done for you, who God has made you to be, and as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with those around you. 
Remember and give your enemies bread to eat. Share the cup with those who stand against you. Remember that you are loved, loved beyond comprehension, and loved with everything that you've got. Remember the one who gave his body, his very life for you, and present your time and your treasure and your talent, your body and your life to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before the Lord. Remember this weekend and every day that comes and heal the sick, feed the hungry, offer new life to those who have only known deathliness. And the hardest of all, especially this weekend, forgive. Forgive and forgive and forgive seven times seven. Remember, my siblings in Christ, remember our merciful Lord with us here this morning in the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember who you are for just such a time as this. Let us pray. Holy one of God, you ask an awful lot of us, but then you have given us everything. You have made us to be your people. You have adopted us as your sisters and brothers. You have made us who we are. Continue to create in us generous spirits, loving hearts and all the mercy and compassion that we will need to live in this world. Grant, Lord God, that we, who are your body in the world, shine a little light for just such a time as this. It is in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Time we are called to confess our faith, the faith of, faith of the church. We're going to use the Apostles' Creed this morning, and for those of you at home, join in with us. For those of you who are here, y'all have these real cool cards in the, in the pews that have the Apostles' Creed on them. If, in fact, you can't remember when you were in confirmation class and they drummed this into you week after week. Be thankful you're not a Lutheran. I have Lutheran friends who had to learn the entire Heidelberg Catechism, so we, we ask you to learn this. People of God, let us say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come now to the time for our offerings to be collected. In this Sunday, in this place, we are going to ask you if you brought offerings with you, your tithes or your offerings with you, we will ask you to place them in the collection plate by the back door or the front door. I'm not sure what we call this door here. We call this back or front. Anyway, the one that's open. Place your offerings, your tithes and your offerings in the plate that is there. Otherwise, if you're at home or even if you are here, you may donate by using the app, the app Banco Mobile. You may donate by mail to the church at 494 Rancopas Boulevard, Rancopas Road. Or you can donate on the church's website, presbychurchwillingboro.org.
Let us bring to the Lord our tithes and our gifts.
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for that which you have given to us so richly. We thank you for the fellowship of your people. We thank you for the blessings of the material things of life. We thank you for the hearts that you have created within us, the hearts that share what we have with those who have not. We ask that you would take what we bring today and use it, dedicate it to your work, to your love, to your kingdom in the world, that all might hear the name of Jesus and rejoice. Amen. We come now to the time for our prayers and supplications to the Lord. It is my habit, it is my practice to ask those in the congregation if they have prayer concerns. Because of our of the fact that we are live streaming today and that Facebook has no protections for your privacy at all. We are not going, I'm not going to ask for out loud prayer concerns, but I would ask that you would let me know that I think there are prayer cards in the, in the queues. If you have a prayer concern that you would like to share, you will write it on the prayer card and we will pray for you during the week. And if you so choose, we will lift up that prayer concern the following week. I will find a way to do that that does not approach, doesn't wreck your privacy. Okay? We especially don't want anybody asking us to pray for their vacation where they're leaving their home empty for six weeks. So we just want to be very careful while we're here. We do lift up all of those who have been so impacted by what happened 20 years ago on September 11th. We want to pray for the families who have been left behind, so many of them, from our own neighborhoods here in the greater New York City area. One of my most powerful memories was cars that were left sitting for months in the parking lot of the Hamilton Transportation Center that no one was coming home for those cars. We want to be in prayer for those families. We want to be in prayer for our country as we, we continue to feel the effects of that attack 20 years ago. We want to be in prayer for our leaders, for all of our folks who are in uniform, whether they are in uniform here at home or abroad, for our first responders, for all of those who have been so deeply impacted with all this. And we pray too for God's church, for the church of Jesus Christ, that we would continue to be a lighthouse of love and mercy in the world. Let us not turn to the Lord in prayer. God, who is our Father and our Mother, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who crowns all your other blessings to us, who teaches us the way of love, who makes sense of the pieces of our lives. As we pray before his cross and invoke the spirit of everlasting mercy and compassion, our faith and our hope reaches out to all humanity, to the world that Jesus loved enough to die for. Remember for good, Lord God, your church and all with whom your church makes common cause for those who are weak and oppressed and without hope in the world. Send your spirit to strengthen us, God of the sparrow, that the ideals of freedom and human dignity that so many have died for would not falter in this generation. Remember for good, Lord God, the leaders of this country and those who desire to lead. Deliver us and them from the curse of false witness, short-sightedness, and selfishness. Let your spirit of grace and truth Drive out prejudice and violence and greed. Open the eyes of our leaders to your image in every human being, that the poor might be blessed, the stranger might be welcomed, the hungry might be filled, and the light of freedom might shine brightly. Remember for good, Lord God, all who are anxious and afraid, all who grieve, all who live in poverty and despair, all who are sick this day in mind and body and spirit. Show them and us the light of your hope. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with compassion. Make us merciful, humble, and kind. Remember for good, Lord God, those who have gone before us, who have taught us something about love that thinks first of the other. We give you thanks this day for women and men who have served their friends and neighbors on the field of battle and on the battlefields of home. 
so many of whom they were, were able to share in the peace and the prosperity they gave their lives to preserve. Grant us your empowering spirit, Lord, that we might honor them always and honor them best as we work tirelessly toward a world in which such sacrifice is never required. A world in which the peace of Christ reigns in every heart, in every household, in every corner of creation. Lord, in all these things, you see the whole where we see only in part. And so we call upon your spirit of wisdom and your spirit of love. We enfold within the arms of prayer all whom we have named before you in our hearts and all whose need is great. In the power of resurrection love, we look for the day when pain shall be banished, illness conquered, war and violence vanquished, and death itself put to death. Grant that now and forevermore we may walk before God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the land of the living. We pray this in all things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, <coughs> thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would ask that you now remain in your seats in an attitude of prayer as we sing our final hymn, A Firmer Foundation. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that in the power of the Holy Spirit, you and I may abound in hope. Amen.